Welcome and greetings from Washington, D.C. I'm Tanya Joshua, Deputy Director of Policy and Communications Lead in the Office of Insular Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Thank you for joining us for OIA Conversations, where we share information and learn more about people, programs, and issues that are important and relevant to the U.S. territories and to the freely associated states. I am joined today by Philippe Izedian, a Duke University student who provides assistance for this series. And today we are joined by Gafar Urbalao, Administrator for the Office of Health Policy, Research and Development in the Ministry of Health in the Republic of Palau. In January of this year, both the Washington Post and CNN published articles stating that Palau could become the first country in the world to be fully vaccinated. Palau continues to lead with the highest percentage of its population vaccinated, and we are pleased to be able to hear today from Gafar, who is running the team on Palau for this very important work. Welcome. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for the for reaching out and for this opportunity for uh, for us to sh uh, share some insight into uh, the work we've done thus far in terms of the COVID nineteen pandemic and, as you mentioned, the um, the ongoing. Uh, COVID-19 mass vaccination campaign that we, uh, we're, um, that's underway here in, in, in Palau. So thank you and, and Felipe as well. Yes, um, so Gafar, can you tell, tell us a little bit about um, your role at the, in the Ministry of Health and what your, yeah. your official title is? Yes, so, so uh, official title, uh, Administrator of the Health Policy uh, Research and Development Office for the Ministry. Um, we uh, look after all of the health research uh, policy uh, analysis, uh, as well as social marketing, uh, health communication, and um, we actually serve as the secretariat for the Palau Institutional uh, Review Board, Palau IRB. Uh, but for the uh, COVID-19 response to the Ministry of Health, I serve as the Deputy Incident Commander for our Emergency Operations Center, our EOC. Um, so basically with that role, assist the incident commander in overseeing the entire response, uh, the national response, uh, as well as uh, assisting with the different sections and, and their tasks and uh, responsibilities if they need assistance from, from myself. So uh, like with other island jurisdictions, we have uh, many hats that we wear. And, and so um, for the Ministry of Health, those are the two uh, roles that I play uh, at present. Um, so. So how big is your team on Palau that, that runs uh, this incident, uh, the, the incident team? Yeah, so initially um, when we started, uh, it's been uh, 14 and a half months now that we've been active. Uh, we activated our emergency plans uh, January 22nd, 2020. Uh, and immediately the day after we started the point of entry screening at the airport and uh, in the seaport, uh, with our partners in the border, uh, border control agencies, uh, immigration, um, customs, and, and biosecurity officers. So we were able to uh, initiate uh, those measures early on in the, in the outbreak. Uh, back then, it was still an, considered an outbreak and, and not yet uh, char characterized as a pandemic by WHO. So uh, the team is actually not just the uh, Ministry of Health personnel. There's uh, uh, key people that, uh, are part of the EOC that come from different uh, other government agencies, uh, for example, uh, uh, the Ministry of Public Infrastructure and Industries. So they assist us with uh, airport operations and, and flights, as well as uh, maintaining uh, government uh, quarantine sites. We also have people that join us from the Ministry of Finance who assist us with the procurement, as well as uh, logistics uh, and the Ministry of State who um, join us uh, to assist us with uh, external communications with our uh, bilateral partners and uh, other uh, allies, as well as uh, uh, international organizations. So a lot of uh, different uh, people from other agencies that join the Ministry of Health in the EOC. So, but overall, um, and, and then we have our um, folks on the ground, uh, so to speak, that uh, ensure the day-to-day -day operations and quarantine sites, including uh, security, uh, national police that provide security at the quarantine sites. We have uh, people from the national uh, hazmat team that provide decontamination um, for the quarantine sites, as well as um, public works people that do 
um, solid waste management. So uh, I think all in all, including our clinical staff and public health, there's uh, well over 50, 60, maybe even 80 people at a time. Uh, and now that we have the mass vaccination, that, that number goes up uh, perhaps even to uh, 100 or so that are part of this um, national response. So a lot of people coming from different uh, sectors that uh, help us with the response. Sounds uh, very um, organized and coordinated. Um, is there, how does the um, Palau population feel in general about, about COVID? Well, I think uh, we've come a long way since uh, a year ago. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, almost, uh, it's almost a year now that we were uh, able to start testing, uh, conduct COVID-19 testing on island. So uh, a lot of um, improvements have been made and uh, a lot of uh, critical infrastructure has been uh, improved and, and procured, equipment, medical supplies. So I think, um, public perception, the community attitude towards COVID has really changed since the beginning of, um, of the response last year. So I think it went from uh, initial fear and, and anxiety. Uh, and then we uh, had all of these improvements coming in. And of course, now with the vaccine. So um, now we have, uh, I guess, a bit of hope. Uh, but the, I think towards the middle or the end of uh, last year, 2020, uh, people became complacent with the uh, our so-called COVID-free status. And, and uh, so, you know, people weren't as careful as uh, the beginning of last year where a lot of the messaging was about preventive measures, hand washing, social distancing, um, and, and wearing a mask if you're sick. But I think towards the end of last year, uh, people uh, became a little complacent with uh, without cases identified. So um, I think that was the, uh, the attitude back then. And now I think we're just trying to uh, reach that goal of, of uh, vaccination, uh, vaccinating as many uh, people as we can. Um, so I think we're hopeful, uh, you know, like everybody else, we're just uh, waiting to, to see this through. But uh, I think um, we have to do it carefully and uh, just uh, in time, you just have to be patient, I guess. So, so you heard in my introduction, uh, you know, the international media is, is, has, has you in their eyesights apparently, <laughs> for, for many yeah. other reasons, but, but also now for COVID. And uh, so is this your, is it your policy to become the first in the world to be vaccinated? That's a very interesting question. I think, mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, it shouldn't be uh, any Ministry of Health or any Department of Health's goal to treat this as a competition or as a race. I think we should uh, keep our focus on our objectives, which is really to minimize that risk of import and uh, subsequent transmission of, of the virus. So uh, I don't think we've shifted our, our attention into seeing this as a race or as a competition, but um, it certainly helps uh, to, to be in, the, in the, uh, the, the status that we're in right now and, and we're blessed and certainly lucky, but uh, I don't think we should, uh, I think it, there's a danger in that in, in seeing that this is a, a status that we need to maintain as, as, a, as a race or a competition. I think uh, most of our team members understand that this that the virus could come tomorrow and, and we should always be prepared. And in fact, we should expect to, to have a case and, and to uh, be able to mitigate that risk when, when it does happen. So we're certainly uh, thankful and, and uh, you know, the media attention uh, is uh, is good and it's uh, it's providing a array of hope for for the community. But I think as a minister of health, we, we cannot lose sight of our primary objective and our, our mandate, which is to ensure the safety of our population. Thank you, and thank you very much for making that point. Um, I, I hope I didn't make it seem uh, light. Um, but what I think what it does look point out perhaps is that uh, you are very. I would say coordinated and organized, and it, it, I think the appearance is that from 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 where I stand uh, is that Palau is is actually doing a good job of of pulling all the pieces together, uh, and and that's so being among the the first to 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 get those high numbers is really testimony to to your collective team's hard work and, and coordination. So thank you for that point. Um, how about repatriation? You are also uh, repatriating folks already. Or yes, 
Yes, uh, I think, and, and going back to, to the earlier point of, of how coordinated we are, I think there's a lot of uh, contributing factors to the success that we've seen uh, today. Uh, it requires, um, you know, political will and a lot of buy-in from national leadership as well as our partners. And of course, the community, um, I think one of the advantage that we have uh, this time around with this pandemic compared to the last uh, pandemic that we had to deal with was H1N1, which is uh, a little over 10 years ago. I think the biggest difference has been social media and that uh, ability to, to um, produce and, and disseminate health messaging instantaneously. Uh, of course, there's uh, the, the negative side to uh, social media with misinformation and a lot of um, information out there that's uh, not helpful for us. But I think that has been really a tool for us to have uh, a lot of the community aware of what's going on and, and therefore they have interest and, and uh, you know, uh, a concern really. Uh, which is good. I mean, you want people to be concerned instead of being uh, indifferent towards the COVID-19. So a lot of uh, contributing factors um, and the political buy-in and, and the leadership. So one of the issue that was uh, one of the major challenges was that uh, first repatriation uh, effort that we um, started planning early last year. I think the last commercial flight uh, to Palau was towards the, the end of March 2020. And so uh, there was a lot of people who were stranded outside of Palau, in Guam, in, in the US mainland, in uh, Philippines and elsewhere. Uh, so we really had to, to um, get an effort going into how we get those people back home. And fortunately, with the leadership and uh, the way things played out, we were able to uh, have our first uh, repatriation flight from Guam, I think it was June uh, last year. A lot of attention in the community. Of course, half of the people uh, had family members who were stranded, so they wanted to see them, uh, wanted to see the government make an effort to bring them home. The other half was still very uh, anxious and concerned about uh, them bringing the, the, uh, the virus in. So uh, eventually there was a decision made at the top level to, to go ahead with, uh, with the efforts to bring back our people, our, our citizens and residents who were stranded. And so that became uh, what is uh, now known as the Palau model, uh, specifically, specifically with the Guam, uh, people in Guam who were stranded. So we ended up uh, having to do a quarantine uh, pro pro a program in Guam, uh, where I think 50, I think initially there were 50 uh, stranded uh, residents who we had to pay for their quarantine in Guam. Of course, their lodging, their meals, and they're testing before they even got on the plane to get to Palau. Uh, so we were able to do that twice um, with the Guam uh, people initially, and then uh, those who were stranded in the, the US mainland. Uh, the other flights, uh, repatriation flight is actually from Taiwan. We had a, a few medical referral patients and their escorts uh, stranded in Taiwan when um, regular service between Palau and Taipei seized uh, around the same time as uh, United flights. Uh, but they were, we actually were able to get a uh, start with uh, chartering medical uh, flights, uh, medical charter flights coming in in April, uh, 2020. So uh, we've been quite lucky to be able to have that. Uh, I think since April, uh, 2020 until uh, the end of March this year, we've had at least 12 uh, medical referral charter flights uh, that were exclusively for patients that needed uh, treatment in Taiwan, treatment abroad. So repatriation. Oh, nice. Yes, wow. 12 flights. So essentially uh, one flight per month, uh, bringing those who need attention, medical attention to Taiwan and then bringing back those who are finished with their, their treatment. So I think overall since um, April uh, last year, essentially a year ago, we've um, been able to repatriate at least 120 from Guam and the US mainland, uh, I think six from the Philippines, and well over 100 um, patients, escorts, returning residents, and essential workers that have come in from Taiwan. So, um, wow. so it wasn't easy, but uh, we've been yeah. able to do it. Yeah. So, in terms of your model, then, were people coming back and also being quarantined on island before being allowed to get to move out into the public? Yes, absolutely. So the, the Palau model was only um, 
was only done in Guam. So essentially those 128 or so people had to endure two weeks in Guam, strict quarantine, meaning that they can't come out of their hotel rooms. Of course, they were fed and, and uh, monitored daily, not just for COVID symptoms, but also for mental health and, and ensuring that they, you know, they, they, they're okay. And then once they got here, they had to do another 14 days. So all in all, um, uh, just under a month of quarantine. So that was, uh, yeah, it was crazy, but I think that uh, it proved to be a model that's uh, useful and, and quite effective. In fact, I think we had two people coming in on the second uh, repatriation flight that were tested positive while in quarantine in Guam. Uh, so unfortunately, they, you know, they had to be taken off the list and, and coming back home, but uh, the, the protocol was effective enough to catch the cases before they even got into, into Palau. Are there Palauans who are now overseas who are still waiting to come back or have you, has that all been taken care of? I think it was, it was a good decision to, to reach out um, to Palauans abroad last year to try to determine who were really stranded, meaning that they're Palau residents, uh, and that they stay in Palau and they, it just so happened they were abroad when, when the flight stopped. So we were able to um, get those people in first. But since then, there's been um, a lot of people uh, flying out of Palau, uh, being outbound travelers, including those uh, medical referral patients and escorts that go to Taiwan. But uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, other travelers have gone to the US and, and, and they want to come back, uh, as well as Palauans who just want to come visit for you know, numerous reasons. Um, some, you know, have to come back because they know they're laid off work or uh, a family member is probably sick or something that they have to come back. So there is a system in place now uh, where we try to capture people who want to come back, not just Palauans, but uh, essential workers and, and people who need to, to come in for work or returning residents uh, who are foreign nationals. Uh, we've been able to set up a system where they can apply for uh, what we call a quarantine certificate to ensure that they're captured into the system and that we can uh, find a way to bring them uh, in. Um, so we've been operating with that uh, up until now that we have this uh, travel bubble with Taiwan. So your travel bubble with Taiwan, thank you for bringing that up. I saw in the news recently where your president went to Taiwan. Um, so is that the only uh, corridor, travel corridor now open? And can you tell us a little bit more about that bubble? Uh, so yes, I think for, for the month of April, for the, the rest of this month, Taiwan is probably the only uh, corridor um, where people can uh, come into Palau. We do have a lot of uh, military folks that are coming, U.S. military folks that are coming in, but they're coming in via uh, military aircraft, and, and they, for now, still have to do uh, quarantine once they arrive, but everybody else uh, would have to go through Taiwan at, at present. We are looking at a uh, potential opening up of uh, the United flight from Guam next month uh, in May, but of course that will depend, uh, that's uh, the president's decision. Uh, but for now, the, the only uh, corridor to come into Palau is through Taiwan, and that's, uh, that's not transiting through Taiwan, that's actually going into Taiwan and doing 14 days of quarantine before they're allowed to come to Palau. Um, so yes, for now, in, in the remainder of this month, at least, it's, uh, it's the only option for people to come in. Who, who pays for, for being in quarantine? That's a very good question. Um, initially, when we started with the repatriation, uh, it was the government that covered the cost for quarantine uh, because uh, you know there was a rationale that these people, it's not their fault that they uh, were stranded outside and it's the government's responsibility to bring them back. But for now, um, travelers who are not necessarily stranded outside, uh, and they just want to come in for uh, to visit or for other reasons. Uh, for now, they'd have to. Uh, it's, it's at their own expense. So the cost of quarantine and, of course, airfare uh, is uh, is on their own for now. Yeah. What is the cost approximately? Uh, approximately, it's 150 a day, um, and that's a negotiated rate with our, our hotels that are designated quarantine sites. Uh, so that's, uh, I think the breakdown is 120 for the room per night, and then the $30 is uh, for the three meals a day. Um, so essentially, really, we're not charging anything for the overhead cost of, uh, you know, the security that's being provided and all the other, uh, the, 
costs surrounding the wraparound services for the quarantine site. So, um, of course, we, we try to uh, ensure that it's a minimal uh, rate for those that are, are wanting to come in, but um, it's still very expensive. So you can imagine 14 days, 150, that's a little over uh, $2,000 just for, for quarantine. And that doesn't include airfare and, and other expenses. So it's, it's quite expensive. <laughs> Indeed. So I think you have a, you already have a team of uh, tourists from Taiwan on the ground. Is, is that, how is that working out? Yes, so I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of that uh, presidential delegation that went to Taiwan and we returned on the 1st, April 1st, with uh, I think 100 uh, tourists. Um, since uh, April 1st, I think there's been two more flights, but um, again, the cost is quite uh, prohibitive for people to, to come in. So they're, I think they're working out ways to reduce that cost. Uh, it is uh, quite uh, a unique um, situation for, for people to be traveling uh, during a pandemic, but uh, I think it's uh, something, uh, it's, it's a step that we've taken that hopefully would lead to some sense of uh, normalcy in, in the future. Of course, it's gonna take time, but uh, according to our president, uh, it, we have to start somewhere. And um, given the situation in Taiwan and how well they've managed to mitigate the COVID risks in their jurisdiction, I think, um, we're comfortable enough to start this uh, travel bubble. Uh, we like to call call it a sterile sterile corridor. Um, and you know, the, the, we can't, it can't be one hundred percent safe, but there's always going to be a risk. But it's probably a risk that we're willing to take with uh, with care. Have you had any discussions in Palau about the? I'm sure you have, but the economy and what what the economy is going to look like now in COVID and then going forward. How is Palau? You you were one of the high, you had one of the highest among the freely associated states numbers of tourists traveling to Palau. Um, hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand. I don't remember the numbers. And now you're. What are your what have been the thoughts around that? Yeah, I think there was a, a, actually a DOI report that came out that uh, did some uh, preliminary uh, projections. And I think the, the number was we, we would have expected uh, tourism to go down by just over 50% uh, and our economy, our GDP to go down uh, a little over 20% this year. Um, so, you know, we're actually quite um, thankful and blessed to, to be able to uh, be eligible for the last year was the CARES Act uh, and now it's the uh, American Rescue uh, Plan Act and, and, and it actually helps a lot with, uh, with the tourism industry, those who were laid off and essentially lost uh, income, source of income because of the decline in, in tourism, but um, that, that really has helped uh, sustain uh, people's lives really since the, the beginning of the pandemic. But I think we just want to make sure that uh, you know there's an opportunity to restart in, in some way now and um, just be just be hopeful that things will get better the remainder of this year and into next year. But yes, uh, uh, although we haven't had a case yet, uh, so we we're not directly impacted by uh, COVID nineteen and the pandemic, but certainly it's it's uh, had a huge impact on our, on our economy. Uh, as well as other things that are indirectly attributed to the pandemic. Could you speak a little bit about your work with the, uh, I think that you are part of, you meet regularly with a group that has a lot of federal federal partners, uh, CDC, Interior is part of that team. Can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, so yes, there's a, a regional, um, it's actually a weekly uh, sort of regional call that just provides uh, around the table updates from partners as well as the, the US API uh, jurisdiction. So um, a lot of assistance uh, from the US federal government as well as um, other partners such as Taiwan and Japan um, and uh, Australia and other bilateral partners, of course, WHO, uh, a lot of assistance from them as well in the, in the UN uh, agencies. But yeah, I think that that really has helped us uh, tremendously uh, just to keep you know people on the same page and, and uh, keep everybody abreast on the developments in different parts of, um, of the region. Um, and, and, and again, uh, going back to our uh, relationship with the US and, and the, the COFA, the compacts, I think 
uh, that has been really the, the uh, assistance that's really made a lot of difference for us uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So yes, again, we're quite um, thankful to be part of uh, what was Operation Warp Speed, and, and now I think it's just Operation, but nevertheless, providing the vaccines that uh, we need. Um, and uh, we've been able to successfully uh, roll that out. And, and we're quite uh, confident that we're on track with what we planned initially from last year that we might be able to reach uh, the so-called herd, herd immunity um, by May of, of 2021. So um, yeah, we're, we're quite uh, thankful that we're still on track for, for that goal. Um, so if you reach herd immunity by May 2021, I suppose the decision hasn't been made yet, but would you be opening up to regular travel then, hopefully? Well, uh, so I think moving forward, um, there's probably two main challenges that we face as, as a country. And one is to accept the fact that the vaccine will be the reason why we get a case uh, because of reopening. And um, we have, the challenge now for us is to uh, get people vaccinated, but at the same time, uh, communicate the, the need for us to go change our mindset from uh, COVID free uh, to COVID safe, meaning that uh, if we open up and when we open up, we definitely should expect to have a case. Uh, so that's one. And, and the two, secondly, the second is that uh, we have to see what that means for us to be among the first in the world to be vaccinated and how that compares to the rest of the world. I mean, this pandemic is not probably not going to be over by this summer. So we have to be mindful that we are in a unique situation that we haven't had a case yet. And it looks like we're going to reach uh, so-called herd immunity in, in, within a month's time. So what does that mean? Does that mean we fully reopen while the rest of the world and, and the, the region is uh, still uh, trying to uh, reach their vaccination goals and trying to get their cases, uh, case numbers down, um, or, or what does that mean? So I think for now, we're being very careful, um, even though we're in a very unique situation, a very ideal situation, but uh, we still have to be careful uh, to make sure that whatever decision we make is, is based on um, good judgment and, of course, the science and, and uh, based on our assessment of the region and, and what's happening globally. Um, so to answer your question, uh, maybe we might uh, be able to reopen, but again, it depends on the rest of uh, the, commun the regional community and the world and how the pandemic is going. We had a conversation with the Secretary of Health in the Marshall Islands, um, Mr. Niedenthal, and he mentioned that they felt, I mean, I suppose nobody is completely and ever fully prepared, but they felt much more prepared now than, of course, they were at the beginning of the pandemic. Do you also have that same sentiment in Palau? Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, I, I mentioned before that where we're at now uh, in terms of our response and, and uh, readiness versus a year ago uh, is night and day. I mean, we've uh, January 22, when we activated our emergency response, we didn't have testing capabilities on island, meaning PCR testing. We didn't have a, a, a isolation site or alternative care site where uh, confirmed cases or even suspected cases back then because we didn't have testing capacity uh, would be uh, cared for that is uh, separate from regular patients at the hospital. So an isolation facility, we didn't have quarantine, uh, designated quarantine facilities. We've never had to quarantine before this pandemic, not in a long, long time. So that, has, that had to be um, established. We didn't have therapeutics as we do now, uh, and of course we didn't have a, a vaccine. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, improvements have been made, a lot of uh, needed medical equipment and infrastructure has been procured and, and uh, improved. So uh, like the Marshall Islands, we're, we're quite happy of uh, the progress we've made within a year's time and certainly boosts our confidence in terms of our readiness to, to get that uh, initial case. Um, so yes, we're, we're quite uh, uh, happy with the, the progress and of course uh, ready, I think, more, more ready than before to, to get that initial case. Yes. Um, now I did forget to ask about quarantine on the, on the Palau side when people arrive. That would be another cost as well. 
Uh, yeah, okay. So, sorry, I wasn't clear on the quarantine. Um, so now we're not doing uh, the, the Palau model with the people coming in, uh, except for Taiwan. So uh, the, Taiwan's, uh, the, the Taiwan protocol is that people who want to come to Palau through Taiwan have to fulfill the Taiwan quarantine requirements, uh, which I think remains at 14 days for everybody else uh, traveling to Taiwan that's not originating from Palau. Uh, so we're kind of uh, moving our border, if you will, to Taiwan and, and catching, uh, hopefully we don't catch a case there with uh, returning residents, but that's the idea of the travel corridor or the sterile corridor is to have a, a safer uh, corridor between the two, uh, two states. Uh, for those that would be coming in from Guam, whether it's from the mainland or Guam itself or, or CNMI or the other uh, jurisdictions, uh, we will not, we're not doing the Palau model anymore, meaning we're not requiring them to quarantine in Guam before they come here. But yes, once they do arrive here from Guam, they would have to undergo the 14 days uh, quarantine here at a government uh, site, a uh, designated site, and they'd have to pay their, their own expense. I see. Okay. And, and so now perhaps you are also incorporating uh, vaccine certifications. Have you been vaccinated in addition to a test? Uh, not yet. So, okay. uh, yeah, it, regardless of vaccination status, for now, people coming in uh, from Guam, if they are coming in from Guam, and of course, the, the military folks that uh, continue to arrive still have to undergo that mandatory quarantine period of 14 days, regardless of uh, whether or not they've been vaccinated. Uh, I think it's uh, moving forward, maybe in a month's time, we'll be able to reassess and reevaluate where we're at in terms of our own vaccination coverage and um, seeing how the rest of, uh, of course, the, the U.S. Is, is really kicked up its uh, vaccination efforts and, and uh, other places as well. But uh, I think for now, we're going to maintain uh, the, the two different categories of travelers. One is the Taiwan, which is uh, we consider a low risk area, and then pretty much everywhere else is a high risk area. So anybody coming in uh, from other places would have to still undergo that strict quarantine measure. Uh, another uh, issue now is, um, you know, we want to be able to, to verify vaccination status. Uh, right now, I think the card that we get for those who are uh, getting vaccinated in the US and the uh, US APIs, we just get a card, uh, which now I think um, there's uh, people in the black market that are trying to sell fake vaccination cards and things like that. So. Uh, I think for now we're maintaining status quo in terms of our quarantine protocols, but of course we can reevaluate the situation uh, at the end of the month. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, if we could switch gears a little bit before we let you go, thank you so much for your time. We're speaking with Gafar Urbalao at the Ministry of Health in the Republic of Palau. Um, if there were no COVID, um, if there were not COVID, um, what would be your what would be the health priorities in Palau? You know, what are the the, the standing health issues that you have in Palau? Um, I think with or without COVID, uh, the the pre-existing issues that have uh, been uh, you know uh, health uh, issues for us, of course, are non-communicable diseases, mm. um, heart disease, cancer, uh, diabetes, mm. um, hypertension like everywhere else in the Pacific Rim, it's, it's a challenge for us. And um, the pandemic just made it worse. Uh, you know, like I said before, many of us uh, wear many hats and, and it's the same clinicians, it's the same public health workers, same allied health people who do quarantine, who do uh, testing, who do screening at the airport, who do uh, numerous things that are COVID related on top of regular services that we have to provide. And, the hospital and public health. So it's the same people, same nurses, same doctors, same public health workers. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that when the focus was shifted to the pandemic, uh, it was very hard not to neglect uh, the pre-existing issues that, uh, you know, chronic disease. And uh, another thing that I want to mention is with the stimulus, uh, e economic uh, stimulus and uh, income uh, protection that we get, uh, not just from the U.S. Uh, um, CARES and, and American Rescue, but also the, the Palau uh, uh, government's uh, stimulus. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, 
car car accidents that relate to uh, you know alcohol use and, and you get island fever uh, without travel and, and people are anxious and, and a lot of uh, anxiety with the pandemic and so uh, we we saw a, a rise in substance use and abuse and, and that led to you know injuries unintentional injuries that uh, cannot be immediately addressed because of lack of flights with the referrals and, and things like that. So again, a lot of indirect uh, consequences of the pandemic uh, in addition to pre-existing health issues that we face. So yeah, uh, a lot of non-communicable diseases and injuries that are, are not related to the pandemic uh, that we, st we still continue to face as challenges. Thank you for mentioning all the indirect impacts as well. I mean, I think we're seeing that in the U.S. Uh, very significantly. Um, in terms of communications, when you are communicating, are you thinking also about Palauans overseas? How involved are Palauans, you know, that are overseas in terms of when you have to communicate to the public? Yeah, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, the biggest uh, or the most effective tool we have now is social media. So the Ministry of Health maintains uh, several profiles on different uh, social media channels, uh, Twitter, of course, Facebook and, and Instagram. But uh, I think a lot of the Palauans abroad are, are well uh, up to date on what's happening in Palau. So we haven't really had the need to uh, communicate with those abroad in terms of for their own health and safety, apart from uh, the basic preventive measure message, uh, messages like uh, hand washing, things that are already uh, you know, being circulated within their own communities, wherever they are. But I think, unlike the other uh, jurisdictions, we haven't really had a need to reach out to Palauans abroad. Uh, we've had several, uh, you know, uh, inquiries and in, in, uh, into uh, what they can do at their end. But I think most of uh, the Palauans, what uh, the questions they ask uh, of us are, are with regards to the things that are happening here and how they can get home and, and things like that. But um, so far, I think. Uh, majority of our communication has been domestic for, for our community here. Now you have a background in communications or media, I believe. Yes, uh, so yeah, I was with uh, one of the um, newspapers uh, when I got back from uh, serving in the military and uh, it was uh, hard to believe that at one point Palau with its uh, small population had three newspapers, uh, not daily of course, but uh, nevertheless three, and I was uh, a reporter for one of them for a couple of years. So I have some uh, uh, media background. And, and when I did join the Ministry of Health, I started with uh, social marketing. So um, a little bit of social marketing uh, and then uh, crisis communication uh, as a PIO for the EOC for different uh, uh, drills and, and uh, actual uh, response events. So. Uh, I guess you can say I have a, uh, a bit of a background in, um, in the media. So, yep, Excellent. it helps. Now, now, I didn't know you served in the military. <laughs> yes, I was a paralegal specialist in the Army for a couple of years uh, right after uh, high school. Um, so I uh, actually enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, just the training and, and uh, being part of a, you know honorable uh, institution, which is the United States Armed Forces. Um, but I decided to come back because I left Palau when I was uh, 10 years old and I wanted to come back and uh, contribute to, to the nation uh, in any way I can. So uh, I've been doing that ever since uh, I came back. So, yeah. Uh, my final question for you. I understand that sometimes when there are high tides, uh, the Palau hospital uh, gets inundated with water. The water comes right into the hospital. Um, can you speak to us about that? Yep, so we're right here at the, the edge of the water and the, the waterfront, and um, we're actually connected by a causeway to, to town where the majority of the population uh, resides. So um, we're quite uh, vulnerable to high tides, king tides, and of course, uh, whenever there's a storm and typhoon, uh, we're, we're quite uh, vulnerable to, uh, to those. So uh, there, there's been many years that we've been planning to relocate or have a new hospital uh, built uh, perhaps in Bubble Dog or uh, even in somewhere in Koror. So uh, those are, are still in the works. And uh, with this new administration, I think they've indicated that it should be a higher priority than, than, than just the improving 
services. So uh, hopefully we can get uh, progress in that. Um, seeing a new hospital built uh, that's not so uh, exposed to uh, natural disasters and, uh, and king tides. We'll let you go. Thank you very much for your time, Ghafar um, Urbalao. Uh, do you have any final words that you would like to share before we leave? No, I just want to want to thank you for the opportunity for us to provide some insights into um, what we what we've been doing uh, for over a year now. I know that everybody's tired, and, and um, we're just uh, waiting for this pandemic to to uh, to finish so that we can have some sense of normalcy in our lives. But I just, again, want to thank you, not just for the interview, but for, for the support that your uh, DOI has provided for us, uh, the Ministry of Health, and, and uh, specifically with the COVID response. I think we were able to get the uh, Health and Human Services team here partially because of uh, DOI assistance. So we're thankful for that as well. So I just want to thank you and um, uh, just want to wish uh, safety for everybody. and. Uh, Hopefully, we'll uh, get to, to see this end uh, soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Philippe.